This is the great Ronnie Cox. Ladies and gentlemen, the RoboCop panel. Have at it, guys. <laughs> Would you want to get the questions, or you have some more stuff? Uh, you no, guys I just wanted to plug my own deal. All right. And yeah. how many people saw Ronnie Cox band yesterday? <laughs> Another amazing event. Uh, no, I just want to tell you, and the History Channel is coming out in seven, six episodes, 90 minutes each, on the Colosseum of Rome. If you ever seen Engineering and Empire, that's my side gig. It doesn't pay the rent, but it's passion. <laughs> so, the emperors, the gladiators, the politics, the materials, the social strata, whatever, History Channel, The Coliseum, one of eight on-camera scholars. And I just got to tell you, there's two guys that inspired me to run. When I was a runner, I was running marathons. And when I was, they said, hey, do you know Ronnie Cox? This is before I ever worked with him. Are you still going to take those pictures, man, when I'm asking you to listen and don't? Don't there you go. No pictures, please. Don't do the pictures while we're talking. It's rude. So That's about as adamant as you get, so yeah. please no. So anyway, Ronnie, somebody said, no, man, if you're a runner, you've got to meet Ronnie Cox or Bruce Stern. They always said, you know Bruce Stern? You know Ronnie Cox? I heard that for years, man, until finally I worked with the guy. So you're a runner. I said, yeah. What do you run? He said, runs beyond my ass. So... Yeah, it, running is a sickness for those of you who've, who've been addicted to it. I used to run 100 miles a week. Uh, that, that's truly sick. <laughs> uh, for those of you who know L.A. at all, I, used to, I lived in the valley, and I used to live in, in Sherman Oaks, and I would run over the mountain to Santa Monica Pier, which is, which is, which is about... God, really? uh, yeah, it, it's it's about about 19 miles or something like that. Two hours and four minutes in my best time. <laughs> yeah. Do you so, understand though? I couldn't compete. You know, the second that you say, "Hey, I run marathons." Oh, really? Have you met Ronnie Cox? <laughs> you know, I said, "I don't want to meet Ronnie Cox." <laughs> he runs runs 19 miles for fun. <laughs> I, I, I remember the first day I met Peter, uh, we were, you came in to get in the, the makeup for the first time, the, the, the suit. Oh, God. And, and, and it's, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but, but, but it's, he was called at 6 o'clock in the morning to get into the, and he, he was going to shoot that day. At 6 o'clock that night, they yeah. were ready to shoot. That's right. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we didn't shoot at all that yeah, day. Yeah, we didn't. <laughs> yes. That was frightening. You know, somebody a long time ago said, you can't talk about those mistakes, but I think I, I've made so many amends with Paul Verhoeven and, uh, and so, many, so many people. But the, the suit came in on a Thursday. We'd already been shooting the other stuff. With you and Miguel and me as Murphy. Then the suit came in, yeah. And they called me in at 6 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And I thought, okay. And Verhoeven thought, okay. And by 12 hours later, <laughs> that's when they finished putting the suit on. Can you imagine this? It took 12 hours to put the they, suit they on. They eventually got it down to like three, didn't they? Well, this is after I go home. Because we haven't shot nothing. I know that day, but I mean, uh, eventually. No, no, then Orion calls up everybody, and then the, my agent calls me up and says they think they're going to pull a plug on the movie. They were, they were threatening to pull a plug. I don't know if you guys knew this. They were going to pull a plug on it. Because Orion was looking like, what are we going to We can't. We can't take 12 hours to put the suit on the guy. So that's when they flew in Moni Yakin, the great genius guy from Juilliard, and they did all these tests in a warehouse all day long because they were going to pull the plug on it. And I got to tell you, we're gonna, I got to give you the hand, the hand to Moni, the, the guy who designed this movement. I, I'll just give you a background of this. Moni, I've taken a lot of dance. I can dance. White guys can't dance, but they try to. Because I'm a jazz musician, man. One of my buddies said, you know, we, we walked into a jazz club one night, man. We walked at this, like, Zouk band. And Zouk band is, like, reggae, except it's French, Caribbean. 
and these guys were not even moving. And my buddy said, you know something? Black people move better than white people even when they're not moving. <laughs> uh, I, I went, yeah, so I would do that. So I would study this mime, and like Ronnie said, and then I, it was supposed to be all liquid, Ronnie. It was supposed to be like, you know, like Spider-Man, right? Like that. Yeah, yeah. And then 12 hours later, I put on this suit. I can't even move. <laughs> uh, I, I'm stuck. So they fly down Moni. And, they, and Paul gets in the warehouse, and they fly down Rob Bottin again, right? They bring him in, and we have to shoot all day in a warehouse, and Moni, you quiet guy, tough, tough, Sephardic Jew from Israel and half French, you know, studied with Marcel Marceau and all the great mimes, and, and he said, can I speak? But when I speak, no one can interrupt me. You know, and everybody was yelling at each other, you know, and, and, and they said, okay, Moni, tell us. And he said, I'm going to tell you what to do. Cut out all the rubber of the inner suit. The hands, the shoulders, the, you know, the, the armpits, the knees, the feet, cut it out. Just so, so it is, right? And they will put on the suit and give me Weller for 45 minutes and you cannot interrupt us. So, you know, for Paul to stand aside and let somebody else take over. You know, God bless him, he's so gifted. But he's seventh gear dude, man, you know. You remember working with him, he's like, ah, 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 ah. you know, he goes like, he goes like a machine gun. And Moni takes me aside, and you guys know this story, but i just just tell it again. He said, okay, now what we have to do, we have to take all this that we've learned and really accentuate it, because we're gonna go out and shoot a test. But, and I started doing this, as when you're moving your arm like that, really like turn it, and head stop and it's got to be huge it felt so phony and so operatic and just stupid you know because he did we'd been working for six months on something that was really sexy and this felt like a big <laughs> rhinoceros man you know and I, it was horrible it was just horrible and he said you got to move the feet boom you know and what happened is after we're working for 40 minutes i said money this feels terrible he says overdo it Overdo it. I'm going to show you a movie. We're going to go to Blockbuster and get and rent a movie. I'm going to show you something. Just keep overdoing it. So I kept overdoing it and overdoing it and overdoing it. I started to get used to it. And then they shot this test. And they shot this test with the hand going like this and the shoulder doing all this stuff, which I can't do very well now. And Verhoeven says, uh, and Moni kept nodding. He says, it's, right? And Verhoeven kept going like this. It's horrible. And Moni in the back behind him, we kept going like this. And I said, Moni, Paul, Paul hates it. And Moni said, um, he actually doesn't hate it, but he's Dutch. And they never admit they like anything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then we worked out, we worked it. And the movie that, that we watched for t all weekend was Ivan the Terrible by Eisenstein's Ivan the Terrible with Nikolai Cherkasov, who's the, you know, you see this naturalistic actors in it, like me and Ronnie. Then the guy who plays Ivan is an opera singer dancer. So when the first time you see him, he looks like Dracula and he walks like this and he talks like that. And I, it's the most hideously phony thing I'd ever seen. But five minutes into the movie, you're hooked on the guy. You can't take your eyes off the guy because it's so compelling. Exactly, and it's great that you pointed that out because one of the things that was sort of a touchstone for, for me in the film was since, since you and he were doing these sort of large operatic moves, Paul impressed upon me that it was essential that my guy be as simple as possible. And so, so therefore, all, it, 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 the, this is the brilliance of Paul Verhoeven, yeah. it, is that, it, is that every, every move he wanted from me and every sort of emotion, every, every aspect of my, like Boddicker is really over the top. Right. But if you look at the one guy that's not over the top, it's you. That's right. It's 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 Dick Jones. Yeah. Because he wanted Dick Jones to be. Uh, uh, see, I I don't know if you, any of you guys know this, but but in in many ways, RoboCop was as big a boon to my career 
as deliverance was beforehand because I had been playing nothing but super nice guys. I had got cat typecast as, as Mr. Sweet Nice Guy. And, and Paul, Paul wanted to trade on that sort of residual goodwill that, that people might have when they, when they see Dick Jones for the first time and they say, oh, this is a nice guy. <laughs> and, and then when he's not, then he's twice as evil. And, and so that was the thing that, that, that we went for. It, it, I, it, Paul was always after me to underplay. Right, right. Well, you know, the, my favorite scene, uh, I mean, look, the funniest scene in the movie is at 209. That's, that's, that's the best scene in the movie. <laughs> I, you know, the best scene in the movie is not me, not Nancy Allen. The, you know, the two best lines are, bitches leave. That's Nancy Allen's favorite line. And my favorite line is, to you, Dick, I'm very disappointed. <laughs> and that, you know, after that. But I, I present you Ed to a night. But my favorite scene, really, one of my favorite scenes, is you and Miguel. When you're losing it with Miguel. When you're like, when you're like look, it looks like you're going to have diarrhea with him, well, man. You know, it's like, you know, well, you, know. y you were saying that, that they were... They were that, the story I heard from, from Paul and from, from John Davidson was that they were thinking of pulling the plug. On, right. on, and, and because it was a fairly low budget film for those days, and, and they, were, they were worried about running over money. And so they, they asked uh, uh, Paul to cut together a scene to show to investors. Right. And they cut together that scene of me with Miguel. And... And I don't know if you know this or not, but, but Miguel was adamantly opposed to me grabbing his hair <laughs> and saying, you just fucked with the wrong guy. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, he was. He was. He, yeah, he was. I, I, Miguel came to me before the scene, and he said, Ronnie, don't do that. Don't do that. And I said... Miguel, we're both actors. We, we know what we're doing. Yeah. And he said, no. He said, I, if you do that to me, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, Miguel, you do what you do. It's going to be. And, and, and he, he desperately did not want me to grab his hair and, 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 and threaten him like that. But to Miguel's great uh, honor, he came to me afterwards and said, Ronnie, thank you for, for making me do that. Because yeah. cause, cause it ended up, it set his character up in a way that couldn't. It set my character up in a way that couldn't. And uh, uh, also, uh, also, it's just, it's just, it's just a despicable scene, man. Yeah. It's about, like, it's two really despicable human beings, man. Exactly. You come from sitting on the commode to coming in and... <laughs> and, 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 and <laughs> I know, I know. I know. Uh, uh, but listen, there's a, there's a lesson in this, what he's talking about, uh... So I got to tell you this, because what he's talking about, and Miguel, God bless him, man, who was a great dude. But there's a dilemma with actors, basically men. When I was just talking about before you came in, I said, you know, women are crazy because men are stupid. And, um, and I watched this great interview with, with Orson Welles and Dick Cavett, you know, with the, I mean, not Dick Cavett, um, who's the guy, the, the Frost, David Frost, remember in the 70s? He, yes. With his, with his, with his, uh, little uh, iPad, it was this little pad and pencil taking notes. And Orson Welles said to him one time about the power, he's talking to him about the power of women. This is like right as the first stage of feminism comes along. And if you guys aren't getting it, I don't care how redneck you are, if you do not understand, if most of you are married, that women are more powerful, I have to say what Orson Welles said to David Frost, who said, I don't understand the power of women. And Orson Welles said, well, then I pity you because you are essentially lost if you do not understand the power or the dynamic you know of mother earth right so there's a great great method actor director who founded naturalistic theater probably named Ilya Kazan you ever know who Ilya Kazan is yeah, yeah. like six about four major motion pictures with Marlon Brando he discovered Warren Beatty and on and on, man. He discovered Brando and James Dean and Marilyn Monroe and he goes, Montgomery Clifton. 
in movies that changed the tenor of American film such that Ronnie and I could go on and make a career out of it. Well, when I became a member of the actor's studio under him and I was 27, you know, he said the problem, the problem with this that he's talking about is that, uh, and this is the metaphor he gave, the self-consciousness of men will translate onto a screen over and over again such as that they will not want to, if they have any clout at all, lose a scene. So in every dynamic that you've ever seen in any scene between two people, somebody wins and somebody loses. That's drama. That's conflict. It just doesn't happen in the movie. It happens in the scene. This scene here, you got the actor saying, please don't grab my hair because he's got to. And are there kids here in a day? There are, all right, so I'm not going to say it. He's got, Miguel has got, the ego of Miguel has got to fold and eat it with him. And you don't want to do that. And Kazan said this, most actors, unless they're gifted, don't want to lose a scene. And it's too bad. And he, tran I'm 27 years old, he said, because I'll give you a metaphor. Before passion... A woman does not care where her clothes fly, yet a man will inevitably fold his pants. <laughs> and he said that in the actor's studio. And I'm 27. I'm kind of getting it. I'm kind of getting it. I, I, don't, I don't understand it. I said, Mr. Kazan. He said, yeah, I'm not going to explain that. It's a, it's a metaphor for the willingness of women, particularly. He said this. A, a good actress is infinitely more interesting to work with than a so-called great actor because a woman does not care where her clothes fly. That means a woman will throw herself into a scene emotionally and will not care whether she wins or loses it. And the great performances by women, I don't care if you're talking about some of the great performances, as much as you don't like her, but she's a great actress, Elizabeth Taylor. If you look at Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, she eats these scenes, man. But a man has to be good. Unless you're talking about somebody with the gifts of Ronnie Cox or Robert Duvall or, say, Gene Hackman or, or Brando, who Kazan actually said was a woman walking around in a man suit. <laughs> you know, and I, I didn't understand that. I said, what do you mean he's a woman walking around in a man suit? He says, you know, the greatest cliche ever done about Brando is that he's in a wife beater screaming Stella, right? Exactly. You, got, you got to look at it again. He's like a three-year-old girl whining. <laughs> He's totally wine. So I go back and look at that thing, and he's not doing Stella. He's like, yeah, he's like having a, a total meltdown baby fit. And I thought, my God, how did, he, how did that cliche get wrong? So I get Miguel coming up to you. I, w I did that. I've done that. I've gone up and said, no, man, you can't grab my, you can't make me look like a, you know, you, you, no, man, you're going to do that. But that scene is my, one of my favorite scenes when you absolutely demoralize him after he's come back with this huge yuppie ego. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it, it works. And, and apropos of, of, of actors and act, there's a, an, an actress, Geraldine Page. But she's an Geraldine actor's studio, Geraldine Page, who was married to Rip Torn, by the way. I love their address, Torn Page. Uh, 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 <laughs> Uh, on their apartment. I never thought about that. Yeah. <laughs> but Geraldine Page was was the only actor, actress. Of, I did a show called Look Homeward Angel with her. And she's the only person I've ever seen. Generally, when, we, when we're rehearsing a play or something like that, uh, people are off doing crossword puzzles or, or running lines or calling their agent or doing something. When Geraldine Page rehearsed, every other actor stopped what they were doing and came and watched her rehearse. I have never in my life seen anyone that, that was as, as fully committed yeah. to making a scene work, whatever it took, whatever it took to make that. And I, and I don't know if any of you people have seen a. A, a little film called Trip to Bountiful that's, yeah. that's with her. 
Or see Newman, Paul Newman in Sweet Bird of Youth. She's... It's just unbelievable, like a, like a dynamic that... And so all I'm doing is trying to celebrate the, the women in the, in, because, because women have given, been given such short shrift in the movies. And, and they have a short sh shelf life, as we all know. And, you know, you have Sean Connery being 79, having a 28-year-old leading woman. Uh, because yeah. because he, he, you can't, so women aren't allowed to, weren't allowed for the longest time to, 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 to be more than 35 or 40 years old. And, uh, and when it finally comes down to it, Peter, the secret of acting, from, from my point of view, is intelligence. Excuse me, but women natively are more intelligent than men. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're instinctively more intelligent than men. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't know if you know this or not, but, you know, Paul, Paul Verhoeven, who directed the film, had a Ph.D. in, in chemistry. As a side like, I don't know if you know, my yeah. wife Mary also had a Ph.D. in chemistry. I she, think he only had a master's degree. I think it was a, I think no. it was a Ph.D. No, because I got a Ph.D., and I've always P out phd to him. Huh? <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, Mary had a Ph.D., yeah. and, and then Mary had a four, four-year postdoctoral fellowship oh, yikes. with Sloan Kettering. Yikes. Yeah, so but I w the secret to, 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 to all of us guys, I'll just pass this along to all of us guys, not just actors, the secret to having a really great, wonderful marriage is marry up. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I said that once to Mary. Mm -hmm. I, I went to Mary and I said, Mary, I know the secret of our great marriage. She's smarter. It, what she said, she said, what? And I said, that I married up. It, it, she looked at me totally nonplussed. She said, what? All men do. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> yeah, 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 uh, yeah. That's true. You know, my mother was 80. My mother was 80 years old. She was a jazz musician. What a hipster. And I asked my mother, I was sitting out with like 15 people in Italy, and she was 80. And she's just in the middle of a conversation. She goes, no, 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 that's not true. I said, listen, Ma, uh, I was 55. And uh, uh, oh, by the way, Everybody's got mothers living. I didn't see my mother in two years. I'm meeting her in Venice at this time. I go to Venice every Hanukkah Christmas, man. I hadn't seen her in two years. And she gets off the plane, and she's going to meet me in Venice. And I, I say, Ma, Ma. And first thing she says is, what's with your hair? <laughs> Can't you get a haircut? You got money? Anybody relate to that with yeah. mothers, man? So I asked her, I said, what is it that women, why is it that, is this a thing that's hardwired into you that at the drop of a hat, you get to, as a gender, change your mind and shift gears and call black, white, white, black? Uh, and the, there's no particular, like, syllogistic, linear thinking in this is just all of a sudden you get the hand grenade you know whatever the conversation was and go no i'm on another track now and I, at 80 years old she just goes yeah 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 we get to do that yeah that's that's what we do yeah uh, you haven't learned that yet I, I, I said well what what gives you the is there a right she goes no it's just hardwired into us i think it's hardwired into us because we can't mug you is what my mother said I, I went, okay, that's good. I get it. I get it. We all marry up, right? Yeah. Women are smarter. Men are crazy. You know, men are stupid. And, uh, they don't have to prove that they're tougher and smarter they than They don't you. have to prove it. That's it. That's what she meant by it. Yeah. Exactly. And, and uh, having been married for, for the, my number of years to, to, to this, to what I thought was the smartest human being on the face of the earth, I mean, it, it, it never occurred to me that I would be the smartest one in a relationship. 
And I I think that stood me in good stead because there's a whole lot of actors that think they're the smartest person on the set. I know. Isn't that bizarre? It is. And and it, and they don't realize that 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 and even playing RoboCop, the secret, it, and it, it, it would be beautifully brought off by you. The secret to even playing RoboCop is is playing that sympathy, that that empathy inside that character. Well, you know, what, what, let, me, let me interrupt you there. Is that after I did this weekend of watching Ivan the Terrible and slowing down all this, you know, sometimes we find it from the outside in. It's not always from the inside out. Right. And go walking around for 48 hours and moving this thing slowly like that, and it became like an animal. And subsequently, I found the vulnerability of this animal by slowing down the thing, which I don't know if I would have found if it was all liquid and sexy and so forth like that. It came to me maybe about the second week of shooting that this this is... And that's the secret of RoboCop. That's the secret of the of the beauty of RoboCop is the vulnerability yeah. of because because I, I don't when I read the original script, I was not knocked out by it. Uh, uh, I it was an opportunity. It was entertaining though, but it wasn't knocked it, out. Yeah, it didn't I knock wasn't it out. because because that pathos, that sympathy, that humor, that that didn't come through in the script. That's that's a triumph of Paul Verhoeven. Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, I mean, on the on the on the written page, RoboCop as a script was okay. In the in the hands of Paul Verhoeven, it became something else. It was, it it has become transcendent. The, the iconic m movie for for I'm sure a lot of you guys. Uh, and women too, but 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 it seems like every young man uh, around the 30, 35 a year of, of age that that's their that's their go-to movie. Yeah. Can anybody tell me in one word, which I didn't get by the way until I was doing it, uh, what the theme of that movie is? Yes, it's about greed. Yes, about trickle-down economics. Yes, it's prescient, so forth. Yes. What one word? What would you say it is? What? He said Frankenstein. What's the theme? In what? No. Nope. Nope. Passion. She said. No. Nope. Second chance. One word. In what? Second chance is one word. What does it mean? What? It's, translate that to one word. Rebirth. Stronger. Stronger. You're on the right track. Rebirth. What? Who, who said rebirth? Re I did. You did? Yeah. Yeah. It's rebirth, man. And every great story you've ever seen is about somebody losing and being reborn. It didn't start with Jesus, by the way. It goes all the way back to the Pharisaic Jews. Before that, goes back to Egypt. It's in, like, Swahili myth. It goes, it's in Thai myth, it's in like Buddhistic stories, oral tradition. There ain't no story to tell. Even Aristotle said it. Somebody goes all the way down and is reborn. That's, that's the only way. And, that's the, and that pathos you're talking about is Verhoeven. Exactly. Uh, and he knew it. Uh, he knew that, that, that scene of going back to the house and loss of it. And it's ultimately a sad damn movie, man. Well, it is because and, and, and that, that he could dress it up in all of that satire. I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the underlying theme is, is, is really important. And, and, and by, by pointing out all the, the, the social norms and, and, and the, 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 I'll, buy, I'll buy that for a dollar, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> you, yes. you know, the, on, on the I one, like it. Uh, uh, yeah. On the one hand, you can you can just sort of lose yourself in 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 just fantasy, but if you get to thinking about that, of of, uh, I mean, Robocop's <laughs> relationship with his family, and when you finally see that 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 come through, yeah. But you know, you know, Ronnie, there's something that's so so like. 
There's something that's so prescient about it. There's two things that make a, a, a big difference to me about it, and I haven't seen it since Miguel died. There was a special screening at the Egyptian that the Egyptian called me up, and me and Neumeyer went down there, introduced it after Miguel passed away. And I'm watching it, and I'm thinking, like there's, like, there's two things that really, really stand out to me right now, and I don't want to get anybody's thing, but I just saw Dope Sick, which is on Hulu. Anybody seen that yet? Because your homeboy, Michael Keaton, is going to win an Emmy for it. And they used all the real thing. It's about the Purdue fam the Sackler family with Purdue essentially hooking generations of people, 500,000 deaths, 65,000 deaths in one year on the Oxycontin. Do you know about this at all? We got an opioid problem. I don't know how many people you're doing, but I do drug counseling. So that said, right, I'm watching this thing. And it's making me think, I just finished it last night. And it's making me think a RoboCop, what Neumeyer and Mike Miner put in it, that Verhoeven hits over the head, that the immorality, if I may make a judgment, about you, but you are given the space to do it from the old man. You know, the old man ain't clean either, man. I, but the idea of it is that you are doing world good. Absolutely. The, 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 the secret of playing, for, for me, playing Dick Jones, the secret was that he was right. He was right, absolutely right. That, that if everybody would just listen to him, the problems would be solved. Yeah. He, he was right. And, 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 and Crimes a month. Us, the city's going down to doobs, man. And, you got to fix it up. And for us to see the irony of that and, and, to, and to deal with it. Has anybody it, ever realized that in this film? Of that course. The, the morality, of, that the message that they're sending out is we've got to fix the police force. Mm -hmm. Just ringing a bell with anything? <laughs> My God, man, that movie is like, the movie will go on and on and on and on. And it's not just because it's like about... You know, a robot shooting the guy in the crotch. That's not why it's going to go on and on and on. But I have to say this, that I'm watching, you know, oxycodone was an opioid. It's heroin. And it was only supposed to be used for d dire pain in hospitals. And the Sackler family developed oxycotton as a time-release version of it, telling the world that it was not addictive that you could get it in a prescription for headaches, for knee aches, straight smack. Only reason is you're not shooting it. Straight up heroin, man, that you can get for it. And you gotta see this dope sick. Because 500,000 deaths later, you gotta see it. It's like 65,000 deaths, not from like smack heads like cooking it up from us getting it from a doctor and thinking oh this is going to fix my migraine man it, you got to see this thing it's a, and the morality of it and they and the, to this day they go no we're trying to fix medication you I, I, we're trying to do the right thing that's what dick jones is saying man when he walks in ed i present ed 209 this is going to fix the police force. exactly it, yeah and do what we do what we tell you to do, and everything will be fine. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the power of the movie. You know, it's not diabolical evil. It's now, like the unconscionable evil in the, ver in the version of trying to do right. I, I think that's why that movie, like, sings to me. And that's that scene with you and Miguel. Well, I think that that's one of the reasons why it has become sort of a, 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 a timeless classic in a way. Yeah. And I, I don't, you probably... I'm glad will. you say timeless classic yeah. because, you know, we've both made films that have become like cult, what they say, cult films. Y yeah. But RoboCop is not a cult film. Not at all. It is a classic, man. It, it, it is. It, it, it sort of moves into a different realm. Now, I know that's sort of self-aggrandizing for us to say that, but, but I really do feel that, that, mm -hmm. that, that in some ways it is a seminal film. I think so too, and I think it's for hooping all over and over and over and over and over again, man. Yeah, it it, it it's a triumph of Paul and mm -hmm. and and of Joseph Acano. Yeah, but but Paul, let me th this thing about Paul's also as an investment in a medieval 
mythology and so forth. They're Paul sitting in my suite. And originally the script in the earlier forms of it had Nancy Allen seeing me twirl the gun, Murphy, it's you, Paul McCrane, I think I know who you are. And all of a sudden Robocop starts to wake up and like, goes off on the thing. It was Paul that essentially in the development of this thing, and I'm sitting in a suite saying, no, 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 no. He's got to start having these dreams like right away. And I'm not getting this. I'm saying, wait a minute, Paul, I think like, don't you think that like, I see Nancy Allen, she says this thing, I see Paul McCrane, then I go and I start having these dreams. Okay, this is Paul Verhoeven, people. If you'd have given that movie to anybody in the United States, not to denigrate my own country, but with sort of a 20th century ideal, instead of a guy who's immersed in mythic, mythic, mythic culture, all the way back to Egypt, which is Paul, you wouldn't have gotten this movie, just like Ronnie said. You wouldn't have gotten those moral fights. You wouldn't have gotten a trickle-down anything. It would have been a nice action movie. Because here's what Paul gives it. I'm standing in this suite in Dallas. I said, Paul, I don't get this about having these dreams. He said, Peter, Peter, it's not amnesia. It's not that all of a sudden he sees something that makes him think and wakes up. No, they've taken everything from him. Everything except his soul and it's his soul waking up it's not his mind it's not his memory and i go give me you know like i'm thinking this guy's really weird man <laughs> okay give me this again he said it, it's like the it's the god-given cosmos whatever you want to call it infinity Zoroaster, one, whatever you want to call the thing, the entity bigger than you, that is God-given. That's what's waking up. And then it's born out in the physical world. The physical world sees Nancy Allen go, it's Murphy, it's you, so forth, right? But that thing waking up is the one thing that they cannot take in a physical world, the soul. I'm thinking, okay, I got to sit down, Paul. I don't know, I understand. I don't, I, and then I see it now, like Ronnie just said, if you didn't have Verhoeven doing that movie, you'd have had none of that, man. Yeah. I got to say, we only have like about two minutes left. This is absolutely amazing. But no, no, man, we're going to take the whole day here, bro. All right, go, not go, <laughs> yeah, go, you go. Thought, you thought this was a panel? You guys, this is a damn so seminar, awesome. brother. Uh, well, There's going to be a I, test. I, I will tell you this. I, I think that, that the censors hurt that film. I don't know if most of you know it. It was originally rated X. And it was rated X, X, X. For, like, they, kept, they kept cutting back because, see, Paul came from war-torn uh, Europe and was used to real, and, and Paul's whole idea was, was to, was to be, be over the top with, with the blood so that you got right away that, oh, I see, we're by the censors cutting back and cutting back and cutting back, they finally got it to where it was just uncomfortable for us, rather than, rather than us seeing blood rushing down the hallway and saying, oh, I see, it's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. So he wanted it to be a joke. And, and, and the fact that they kept cutting it back and-, and Made it more violent. More. It was much more effective because I saw the early. Yeah, I saw. If you get the director's cut, the scene with Ronnie, where he introduces that 209, you have 15 seconds to put down. You have five seconds to comply. Everybody starts running. That scene in the director's cut goes on and on and on. He bounces all over the room. People are screaming and crying. It's hysterical. Exactly. Exactly. That scene, I think, went 17 times in front of the MPGA. I, but poor Kenny, who, who took those. You've never seen anyone because they put <laughs> full loaded uh, uh, squibs on people. Oh man! And I'm telling you, they will put you to your knees. Even when 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 Dick Jones was shot out of the the window there, they they put they put packs on front and back on me, and it was so powerful. I went to my knees. Yeah. And and I had to go to the bathroom and throw up. Uh, so Paul Paul wanted. <laughs> Uh, us to suffer. <laughs> yeah. Sadistic son of a bitch. <laughs> I know. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. 
We can't thank you guys. Listen, listen. Oh. Let, let, let's take five questions. Okay, before we go. five questions. Five knock questions. Them out. Who's got a question? Knock them out. Yeah, in the back there. Stand up. Yes. What you? Yes, you, with the beard. Just the, come on. Yell it out. Come on out. Question. Let's knock them out. Yell it out. Right here, sir. So, uh, RoboCop to me and so many, I, I think is one of those films that's, it's almost Dickensian. If like Charles Dickens were alive in our time to write a science fiction uh, story, in the way that it just peels away the layers of everything. And I was wondering if there are any other films that you both enjoy, like RoboCop, that you think kind of do the same thing, that peel away all the mess. I've seen one, uh, the thing that won the Oscar about 10 years ago, it beat Guillermo del Toro's movie. I saw it at a special screening called The Lives of Others. Yeah, we run it now. The Lives of Others, which won the be Oscar for Best Foreign Film in 2010, I think, about the last days of Stasi. It peels back the layers of suppression, and then it's beautiful. You don't know where it's going. It's absolutely donor's mark. That's the only one I can think of. There's, there's definitely one. Okay. All right, okay. I have a question right here. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Go. Knock it out. Just yell it out. Go, go, go. What was the, how did you get the role of RoboCop in the first place? Uh, I, I heard, uh, uh, just quickly, uh, my agent, my longtime agent said, this guy, Paul Verhoeven's doing a movie about a robot. I don't know what it is. The script doesn't finish. Uh, do you want to meet the guy? I'd seen every movie that Paul Verhoeven had made. I knew that Paul Verhoeven made small stories about the interaction of people with a big operatic backdrop, Spider, Soldier of Orange, Fourth Man. So I went in and just told him that. I said, I want to be in your movie. And we met about four or five other times. That was it. I never auditioned. Okay, yeah. right over here. Question yeah. right here. Good afternoon, guys. Um, the 2014 RoboCop version did... Never saw it. Don't care. I was going to ask if either of you had a... <laughs> next, qu next question. <laughs> right back here. What was it like putting the suit on for the first time? Uh, we just talked about it. It's 12 hours. Okay, we okay. have the last question right here. Say, give, give me something better than that, man. Is that my friend Bob yes. Byron there? Uh -huh. Hi, sir. Yes. Yes. Um, during the production of RoboCop, um, this is a question for you both. What part of yourselves did you put into the characters you respectfully played to make them better, convincing, and masterful and triumphant as they are. I'm going to let Ronnie take that because I just explained mine, Byron. Mine was is that I designed, we designed a serpentine kind of movement, and I found the animal, the loss of the guy, in slowing the whole thing down by accident. There's a crisis. You know, every crisis has an opportunity. The crisis of the suit gave me the transformation of the character, but Ronnie's got his own answers, I'm sure. And for me, playing less is more. I mean... Real powerful people, real uh, tyrannical people, don't have to prove how tough they are. Wow, is that true? You, you know, that, and they know how powerful they are. And so the key for me to playing Dick Jones was underplaying it, was knowing that whatever the hell I wanted to do was going to get done. And, and... The great thing about that, I'd spent my whole life trying to be a good person and, and, and being nice. It's kind of nice to run around the stet and not have to be nice to everybody. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. I listen, I'm going to say one last thing before I go because it's based on what Ronnie just said. There's a wonderful movie based on a Tennessee Williams play. Anybody know who Tennessee Williams is? He's one yep. of the greatest. Right, yep. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 yeah. So Tennessee Williams wrote Sweet Bird of Youth. Go see Sweet Bird of Youth. There's Geraldine Page in it. But his first play is called Orpheus Descending. And it was made into a movie with the great Sidney Lumet, who did a lot of movies in my second movie, called Fugitive Kind. Now, the original play of this, I want to tell you, what Ronnie was talking about, was supposed to be Brando in his prime, like a stud, with amazing actors that nobody knew her age, named Anna Magnani. And he told, he was doing Sayonara, and he told Truman Capote on the set, they said, if I, they think I'm going to get on a stage and get eaten alive by Anna Magnani, and no one knows how old she is, and she's got fire coming out of her ears, they're making, so he never did the play. But they got them both to do the movie. And you want to see a woman who you don't know her age. We never knew her age. She may be close to 50 doing that movie when he's like 28. They never knew her age when she died. You got to see it, the fugitive kind. 
But I just want to tell you this about what Ronnie said about women. Tennessee Williams was gay. Tennessee Williams never had a relationship with his mother, uh, with, with a girl. But he based all of the women, some of those powerful, dynamic characters you can ever read or see, played by these astounding actresses, based on his sister and his mother. And his sister and his mother, Stella, his sister. And she was lobotomized, sadly, when lobotomization was legal. The mother did it. But in this movie, this thing is like, this is a game changer for me about women. I was 18 when I saw this movie. And I've seen it again as recently as a year ago. And in it, late at night, Brando, who plays this guitar player on the run, has got, a, got hired by this Italian woman who owns a shoe store whose husband is a racist who's broken his leg. And they're, it's the dead of night. She's asking him this question, about who are you and where you come from? And this is Tennessee Williams saying this, and it Brando, brilliant, says this line. A woman can burn a man down. A man can't burn a woman down. There you have it. Epic Q&A. Do better than that. This was, you get, where was, this was a schooling. The RoboCop panel. Peter Weller, Ronnie Cox, absolute man. You guys can do better than that. This is a real life performance for you. They're headed back to their tables to sign and hang out. <laughs> Wonderfully intense Q&A. Keep it going one more time. Hi, this is Michael Shanks, and you're watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. The fate of the universe may depend on it. And have fun, and follow your fandom.